Hello, this is Yulia. Um, I would like to talk to you about diatoms today. The reason I know lots of people are like, what, diatoms? <laughs> I, th I think most people haven't heard of them, um, and there's a reason for that. It's usually because they are mainly mentioned in the world of science, because they are a medium through which people find out about things and the environment in particular, and so therefore the people who are non-researchers don't usually need to know about them. However, I was thinking that um, at my in my university uh, we had to research our dissertation topic completely from scratch and I'm studying environmental geography and um, one of the things which are widely used within dissertations are diatoms, physical dissertations at least, are diatoms and um, when I came to the station I didn't really know much about them, so I think this could give everyone a very a much more easy introduction into diatoms rather than having to read about them. And for those who are not doing any study in geography or don't need to do a dissertation in geography or in diatoms, um, this also for those people who might may find it interesting to just listen about diatoms because I love them so much and I'm just well I don't really love them, I'll be sad. But I'm just I'm very proud of them. I think they're amazing things and more people should know about them. Well, <laughs> uh, diatoms are microscopic algae which are used to reconstruct environmental changes. Uh, the reason for this is because firstly uh, there are a thousand species, around 30, over 30,000 species and that's and not all of them, lots of species of diatoms have not been discovered yet. And this is really good because uh, each different species is uh, adapted to different environments, which means that um, the presence of a certain species can show us the exact environment that it can that it will have lived in. So, because there are so many species, it means that we can reconstruct the different nuance changes in the environments of the of the lake or river, diatoms can be found, although they are algae, they can be found not just in lakes and rivers but also in ice and they are very they are very ubiquitous in sediment as well, um, which means that they can be present in many environments which where nothing else can be present is present to study. So therefore um, they are very useful when there's nothing else that can be used to study and to reconstruct the past environment. And um, additionally, they're also, the reason that they're really good is because they preserve really well in for thousands of years, for millennia, and um, in most, in many environments, especially non-alkaline ones, um, which can be very useful when there's nothing else present to allow a study to happen. So. This is why the, these are the basic reasons why diatoms are used uh, in studies, and the way the way that they are used to reconstruct past environments is they are examined under a microscope, and the different species are uh, identified by the researcher, which is what I had to do during my last summer. It was so fun, <laughs> and. Um, this way, once we've identified the different species present, we can, and the changes in species over time, uh, we can reconstruct and we can have a look at how the environment has changed, and far from the species changes, how the environment has changed as well. Um, so, for example, in my case, I studied the an upland remote lake in Wales called called Lincoln Way. Um, this lake has been, the remoteness of it suggests, may suggest to to somebody who doesn't, hasn't studied before that the lake may have been less affected by pollution than other more industrial lakes or maybe it hasn't been affected at all. There are lakes in the world which have not been affected by pollution at all, almost at all, as far as we know. Um, so. There, is there was a possibility that this lake may have been similar. Uh, however, according to my study, I have found that the lake has actually acidified as a result of industrial uh, acid deposition, which I inferred by 
because um, by looking at the fact that uh, there was an increase in acidophilic and uh, acidobiotic species, which are acid loving species um, of diatoms, um, <coughs> which suggested to me that there has been acidification occurring. And this has happened uh, during the time that the um, Industrial Revolution took place. So, obviously, from that, it could, be, could have been inferred that this has happened due to industrial revolution, industrial pollution deposition. Additionally, I have also used uh, magnetic susceptibility as another um, another proxy for industrial pollution. And magnetic susceptibility is just a um, change in magnetism of the sediment of the lake. And um, the change in magnetism can occur for different reasons, for example, uh, it can be due to a change in the sediment type or the area from which the sediment is derived. And different sediments can contain different amounts of uh, magnetic material. So this so basically it means that uh, magnetic susceptibility changes can um, reflect on the erosion changes within the catchment. Um, however, it can also mean uh, that there has been a uh, deposition of heavy metal pollutants and other industrial pollutants, um, which is what I thought has happened in my case, which is what I inferred. And, um, and the diatoms seem to have supported that, so diatoms and mag magnetic susceptibility have told me that um, Investigation has happened as a result of industrial revolution. This is very important because it has legislation implications as well. Since uh, acidification and processes like this of pollution and the heavy metals themselves can be very dangerous to the aquatic environment. Um, for example, uh, acidification can mean that heavy metals such as aluminium can be released, which from the sediments because they're not because the environment of the lake changes, so the heavy metals can be released and they can be very dangerous, they can be toxic to the um, aquatic organisms. But uh, additionally to that, um, heavy metals also uh, decrease the amounts, they flocculate, aluminium flo flocculates to the, um, to the nutrients such as silica and um, no, and they stop the um, that they stop the nutrients being available to the plants for intake, which of course can have very negative effects um, on the whole ecosystem of the lake. Um, additionally, uh, the additionally the release of heavy metals can mean that. Um, Metals themselves can be toxic, as I already said, but also the acidification, or other, sorry, I'm very tired. The acidification of the lake can mean that there is a decrease in decomposition of organic matter, which can also mean that there's a decrease of uh, nutrients available for plant intake. And obviously, it affects the whole food chain where if there's less primary productivity or less plants being produced, then uh, there's less food for the for the organisms um, above in the food chain. What is that? Sorry, there's some somebody walking. Uh, additionally, um, toxic metals pollution, as I have already said, need to be examined too. And uh, yeah, so there are many different things that. Uh, a diatom analysis can tell us, and as a result of having found out um, that acid deposition has occurred and um, and heavy metal pollution has occurred in the lake and in different other lakes in the world, um, so the sulfur protocol has been passed. So for example, in 19, around the 1950s, 1960s, um, it has been widely accepted that 
um, pollution has affected most Lagostyne River Rhine environments. Um, and uh, as a result of that, legislation has been passed to reduce um, sulfur deposition, acid deposition, um, and acid uh, production in the first place, pollution, um, which of course is very important as we have seen just now, as I have described how um, toxic, how bad the, um, the negative effects that the pollutants can have on the aquatic environment. And um, mm, so the same uh, examining the atom data can also help us to understand how we what will happen, how we can recover the lake, and what will happen if we if we have as a result of certain actions. Uh, for example, in my study, I have found that um, the lake has acidified a lot later than. Well, not a lot later, but significantly later than the other lakes in the area or the other lakes in the world have acidified. Um, so, and this, the diatom data has shown that it wasn't related to anything yet to uh, the catchment changes, and I have also understood that it wasn't related to geology either. So, uh, because. Yeah, so because of that, this suggests that the groundwater flowing into the lake must have contributed towards the buffering capacity of the lake because groundwater can often be alkaline. And uh, this suggests that the groundwater of Indian Conway must be alkaline as well. It's very likely that it's very alkaline and uh, it therefore buffered the lake from acidifying so quickly for a long time. This gives us some amazing easy and quite natural um, restoration strategies which are to, apart from decreasing the sulfur, the pollutant uh, deposition, we, we can also um, divert the groundwater into the lake to speed up the recovery of the lake, which can be, which is one very good side effect of almost of my study, which is what I have found. So. Yeah, so this why diatoms can be so useful for everything. And they can also be, recently diatoms have also been used to see how lakes have recovered and lakes have started to recover from acidification, which is great news of course for everyone. And um, however, I wasn't able to study these changes in my, in my uh, lake just because um, uh, the core, the top of the core, the most recent, because that was the diatoms I found in a sediment core, and the top of the core was missing in my lake. So I couldn't study how I couldn't study that. Uh, the recent changes, how a different core can be taken, and the same study can have can be done on the top of the core to find.